Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 11, titled, Prayer Diagram, Part 7, Forgive Us Our Sins, Part 2. Good morning, everybody. You ready to study the Bible? That's what we do. We study the Bible. We believe it's the Word of God. We believe the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. Every Word of God is true. What the Bible says disagrees with the way I've been thinking, the way you've been thinking. We will change by God's Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. We've been now, I think, seven times together over the topic of the Lord's Prayer, as we call it. And uh, we're going to be, we're going to still be for a while. There's just so much for us to discuss here. And uh, uh, Sundays to come, let's just say that, uh, because the next topic, which is, um, we're still on the topic of forgive us our debts. The next topic is as we forgive those who are indebted to us. It's actually much harder. So how do you get forgiven by God? Just ask. How do you forgive others? Woo, wow. I got some magic dust. I'm going to sprinkle over all of y'all. You're going to be able to do it. No, that's not. If, if only. So hard when people sin against you. But we're going to be getting to that. And anyway, we still need to deal with this whole issue of God's forgiveness of us to begin with. But it's all in one clause there. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive those who are indebted against us. So let's look at it. Chapter, chapter 6. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, that is the pagans, Jesus says here, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Of course He does. He's God. Pray then in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We've seen these. Each one of these is, is a whole category you could spend hours literally praying on. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. There's another category. Thy will be done. Another category. On earth as it is in heaven. Wow, additional category, right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Notice daily bread, that means I've got to do it again, ask for it again tomorrow. It's tough. It's tough when you can buy half of HEB with a credit card in your pocket, right? Out of bread. Why is he asking you to do that? Well, we've been looking at that. Forgive us, give us our, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. That's where, we're, that's where we are. As we also have forgiven our debtors. We've been looking at this issue of forgiveness. Why, why, if it is true, and it is, that I have been forgiven of all my sins in Christ? In fact, when Christ rose 2,000 years ago, he died hanging on a cross knowing all that I had done and would ever do. So nothing Bill does or you do, having accepted Christ, is going to shock God in any way. He's the God who knows everything. As Jesus says, he already knows what you're going to ask before you ask it. So he already knows all your sins when he died for them. In fact, he did it 2,000 years ago. So why do I need to keep going back? Why, why even include that since I've already been forgiven? Don't we believe we've been forgiven? Absolutely. Well, I can answer that question with another question. So why does he ask you to go back every day and ask for bread when you could buy half of the bread at HEB right now with a credit card in your pocket? Good question, right? Good question. Because, because when you had that capacity, when, you had this, when, when you're steeped in forgiveness like I am, I've been raised in the church all my life, taught about forgiveness of Jesus, the, 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 the sacrifice of Christ and the fact that my sins have been paid for completely. I, I, I have, I've been taught that for, for, for years and years and years. So I'm, I'm steeped in forgiveness just like I'm steeped in the ability to buy bread. So God asked me to continue to go back to him to ask for forgiveness and ask for bread because I forget, even though I have this capacity, I forget that I'm dependent upon him for every last bite and I live every day on his forgiveness every day so yes he's forgiven me but i i still am in a, in a constant state of being forgiven a constant state of being sanctified a constant state of being able to be in, in need of refreshing the relationship that i have with him so so i'm being shaped in prayer it's shaping me it's it's humiliating by the way so i can buy out half of h-e-b with my credit card and he asks me to ask for bread every day that's humiliating yeah he knows that he meant it that way it's one of your biggest problems, and mine too, is humility. Because we forget, we are literally hand to mouth. So I can buy out half of H-E-B's bread, but I, God doesn't want me to live another breath. Guess what happens? Boom, what goes your credit cards? All the bread you could buy. So you're totally dependent upon Him for everything. We forget that. Because we I get our stomachs full. I'm fine, I'll be fine, I don't need you. Oh no, you need Him. You really do. I'm feeling good about myself. My, I've been cleaner 
sin-wise, this is the cleanest I've ever been. Yeah, but you're still dependent upon him for forgiveness every single day. Never forget that. So this, is, this humiliating prayer, if you will, is very pointed that way. We're being shaped. We're being changed by prayer. The whole purpose of prayer. We're, we're having our agenda become God's agenda. Or God's agenda is becoming ours. God's will is becoming our will. We're not taking anything to heaven. We're not improving heaven or instructing heaven when we pray. Instead, heaven is instructing us. I am being changed. I am being shaped. That's actually what needs to happen here. So let's, let's just run down and be reminded of, of the different clauses that we've gone over here. So if we, he says, pray, hallowed be thy name. So if I don't pray that, do I steal from the glory of God? If I don't seek the glory of God today, is God's glory diminished even one little bit? Of course not. And if I pray, hallowed be thy name, if I seek the glory of God, does that add anything to the glory of God? No, it does not. You're not God does not need anything from you. Oh, the whole heaven is dependent upon whether I glorify him. <laughs> you think way too much of yourself. The whole world together refuses to glorify God. Guess what happens? He's still just as glorified. He always has been. He always will be. You're not robbing anything from him. You cannot rob anything from God. The, the, the problem with not glorifying me is that you miss out on that glory. It's, it's heaven. Prayer is for you. It's not for God. God doesn't need your instruction or help or advice on anything. It's to help you. So, so glorify him. If, if I fail to say thy kingdom come, I fail to seek his kingdom first in my life. Does that keep his kingdom from coming? No. It's coming, guys. And whether you're with it or not, you don't want to be on the wrong side of it to be sure, but every given day you can be on the wrong side of it because you forget to be a part of it. So, so you're missing out on the glory and the, the possibilities and the blessings of being a part of his kingdom. Again, his kingdom's coming. You're not changing anything. You're just changing whether you're getting the benefits from it. Same is true when it comes to thy will be done. So if I dig my heels in and fold my arms and dig in my heels and furrow my brow, is that going to stop the will of God from coming? Hardly. It's happening whether you want it to or not, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. It's not like gravity. It's falling, guys. It's coming. It's going to happen. But whether you're blessed by that will, whether you're a part of that kingdom, whether you're receiving the benefits of it, that's the decision you're making whether you pray or not. That's what you're doing. You're not changing anything with God. Not at all. Same is true. Give us this day our daily bread. So he's promised in the Bible to supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ. So if I don't pray it, do I not eat? So I got over here a bunch of sheep, right? All sheep here. Some had their head on pretty good. Some not so good. So he just feeds the ones who had their head on right, and the rest of us he starts, right? Now he feeds all of his sheep because he knows that we're a bunch of dummies, and we gotta, you know, he takes care of us. That's the way God is. He feeds you whether you're doing it right or doing it wrong. He still takes care of you. Think of all the people who are cursing his name out there who are filled today. Why? Because he's a kind God and the earth is living off of forgiveness. That's all. I'm not asking for God. But, but we come to God and ask for bread, number one. Why? Because he told us to. If, if we'll just simply learn when it comes to the Bible, do it. Don't try to wrap your head around it first. As soon as I get my head around this, then I'll do it. No! When he says do something, do it. And then here's what you'll find out, or what I found out, is God will bless you with understanding if you'll obey him first. So I obey him, why do I ask for, why do I, why do I ask for bread? Because he said to. And then also I realize because it's humiliating and I need that. It's also because I'm living off of him every single day. Yep, I'm dependent upon him for everything. So I learned that in that process, but I obey him first. Likewise, it's true with forgiveness. So I've been forgiven in Christ Jesus 2,000 years ago. So why do I need to ask for forgiveness? Because he told me to. He told me to, and also it's a reality for me. I need to realize what's, what's going on in my life. Yeah, my life's way better than it was when I got saved, but I'm still dependent upon forgiveness. Still totally dependent upon him. Again, it begs the question of what is the purpose of prayer? We have a tendency, purpose of prayer, purpose of the Lord's Prayer, is because we have a tendency to become confused. By the way, it's a standard for sheep. Sheep are confused every day. It's sort of just the way they live. They live in a state of confusion, constantly. So thus, the best thing a sheep could do is look to the shepherd who isn't confused. So that's why, you know, the Lord's the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, you've got to accept the role as a sheep then. I'm a sheep who's so confused. Okay. 
I got to look to the shepherd. If a, sheep, if, if, you, if a sheep could talk, one of the most common phrases you would hear coming out of the mouth of sheep is the words, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What's going to happen today? I don't know. What's going to happen tomorrow? Now you don't know. Should we eat this grass or not? Or should we lie down? You know, it's interesting. You know, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. You ever thought about that phrase? You know why? Because a sheep will stand up and eat itself to death. They will. They're that dumb. They have to be made to... No, sweetie, you can't keep eating. By the way, this is the season in which all these sheep here, right? We're all just eating tons of food. So the pastor's making a big thing about gluttony. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We don't have enough sin. We can kill ourselves on food. The sheep do that because they, they, they don't know stuff. They just don't know. Should I eat this grass? Should I lie down it? Should I drink this water? Stay away from it? They don't know. They don't know. Every day, guys, we suffer the same fate, don't we? Every day. Can you tell me what's going to happen this afternoon? You have a general idea, but you don't know. Much less tomorrow. How all this craziness that's going on in our world, how it's all going to be reconciled? You don't know. Neither do I. Anybody says they know is, you know, they're just that dumber, that much more dumb. Because we don't know. We don't know stuff because it's the standard classification problem issue with sheep is that they're confused. They're always confused. So the only hope they have is to look to the shepherd. So constantly God is drawing us into this shepherd-sheep relationship. And one of the ways he does that, one of the ways he watches over us and shepherds us is through prayer contact constantly with the shepherd constantly the sheep need to be looking at the shepherd constantly constantly pay attention to what i'm doing pay attention to what i'm going don't get distracted don't run off don't think you've got it figured out constantly we are confused we wake up every day confused we wake up in a new world and we forget and become confused about uh who we're supposed to glorify right so jesus teaches us every day say have the attitude of god i want you to be glorified every day we get confused about that Every day we get confused about uh, 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 the, the priority of his coming kingdom. What should I do with my life? You should be involved in the kingdom of God, guys. You're truly throwing your life away if you're not. Every day we've got to have that. Every day we've got to have this, this, this constant reminder. So he teaches us to pray. He's shaping us. Every day we forget and become confused about whose will is superior. I wake up every day thinking my will should be the, the, the will. No, no, no. He teaches us. He shepherds us. He guys says, no, the will of God. You're going to mess up. You're going to have a huge problem if the will of God is, if, if you're outside the will of God. He's shepherding us. He's shaping us. We forget and become confused because our bellies are full. I'm, I don't need a shepherd. My belly's full. Yeah, but you, the shepherd is going to tell you the next thing you need to eat and the next thing you need to go back to the shepherd. We forget and become confused. We forget and become confused about our sin, about God's forgiveness. And so, uh, we clean our lives up like I think and we think somehow we don't need the shepherd anymore. Oh, no, no, no. That's why he teaches us. Pray every day. Forgive, us my, forgive me of my sins. Every day. So one of the processes that we're going through these, these phrases here in the, in the Lord's Prayer. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the clauses here is we need to learn how to pray every day. God, forgive us. In fact, the, the clause there is forgive us. I'm sorry. Uh, daily ask for bread. That word daily also applies to the next clause, which is daily ask for forgiveness. Every day. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? You say, well, that's humiliating. Yes. You've got it. You need that. We, we, we think too highly of ourselves. Too much about what's running around between our ears. There's not much going on up there. We're sheep. We're confused. We need to go back to him and say, God, help me think correctly. Help me understand my world correctly. So, so sin, one of all the blessings and all the mercies and all the gifts of God that God has given us, the greatest, hear me, is forgiveness. The greatest of all the things God has done for us, that he offers us forgiveness is the greatest thing that has ever happened to humanity. Since sin is the greatest harm, the greatest danger we face is paying for our sins in an eternity in a place called hell. Since that's the greatest danger of humanity, the greatest need of humanity is forgiveness. And God is giving that. He's offering that. In fact, let me, let me show you how he's not just offering it, he's really offering it. Look at this. Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, O Lord, are good. You better be very thankful for that. He could be anything you want to do. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive. 
The Hebrew literally says, eager to forgive. And it's like something, you want to make God's day? Let him forgive you. He longs to do that. You know how ready God is to forgive you? He sent Jesus to die for you 2,000 years ago. He's 2,000 years waiting for you. So why are you holding up? Let him forgive you. Humble yourself. Cry out to him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You're going to find out he loves to hear that. He's been waiting to hear you say that. That's who God is. Longing. He's ready. He's ready to forgive you. He stands ready. One of the most dramatic scenes in the part of Jesus' suffering on the cross is the part where, as they're murdering him, he says, Father, forgive them. Wow. Wow, of all the things he could have prayed, of all the things he could have said, he prayed exactly what we need. God, forgive them. Forgive them. Forgiveness is, means to remove our sin. You know what the definition of sin is? Or the definition of forgiveness? Here it is. It's to be, it's, God defines it for us. It's to take your sin and my sin and place it on Jesus and punish Jesus for those sins. So not just the sin, but also the punishment that was ours, richly deserved. He has taken it and placed it on Christ and punished Jesus for it. Here's one of many places that describes that very thing. But he, speaking of Jesus, was wounded for what? Our transgressions. Mine, yours. That's forgiveness. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And in, by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, uh, turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's forgiveness. That's what God has done for us in Christ. God has forgiven you. It, it wasn't just arbitrary. I mean, people had this idea of God, some old man upstairs, uh, the man upstairs, they say this, this old guy who's just kind of letting people in the back door. You know what I didn't really mean? I know I wrote those Ten Commandments, but ah, I was just mad. I was mad that day. Ah, don't worry about it. No. He was very serious about those commandments. So serious that he won't write a one of them off without them being paid for. Instead, he makes his son pay for it. How, how desperately does he want you to be with him if he's willing to treat his son like that on your behalf? You see how, how serious he is about forgiving you? Something, I don't know what it is. He want, I, Well, I do, but I, it doesn't make sense to me. I, no, no offense, but I wouldn't want you in my life that bad. I just wouldn't. I mean, I love all y'all, some more than others, some less, some of you. but I frankly don't want you in my life that bad. To put that, put that on my son just to get, forgive me, nasty old you? No. I, it doesn't compute with me. Shouldn't compute very well with you. But it should tell you there's something happening, something God wants that we bring to him that is worth that much to him. He was very serious about it. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is placing our sins on Christ and punishing Jesus for them. Forgiveness is covering our sins, Psalm 85, 2. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Covered, just covered them, buried them. It's, it's to have them covered. It's to have them uh, blotted out, Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Notice, and find the reason in you. So you're sitting around thinking, yeah, you know, God figured out how awesome I was. That's why he did all that. No. He found the reason within himself. And that reason is love. He created us for himself. He loves us. He's reconciled us to himself by the death of his son. He's blotted out our sins for his own sake. For his own sake. In other words, it makes him happy to do it. There he is. And he remembers your sins no more. He totally wipes it out. Forgiveness is, is that. It's, it's, it's blotting out our sins. Forgiveness is having your debts to the Almighty canceled. You're sitting, how many debtors do we have in here? Anybody got debt? How much debt do you have? I don't want you showing the hands. So, so let me ask you a question. So if we took your, your current salary for 2022 projected, and we put it up against your debts. We paid all your entire salary against your debts. How much would you have left? 
That's your, by the way, that's your debt to your GDP. If you want to know, you're gross, you're pretty gross, no offense. No. You're, you're, you're domestic, very domestic product. What you can produce based upon your debts. Well, we have a, a here's, here's just an idea of how indebted our world is today. You hear a lot about that. We have a nation that's indebted tremendously. You know the greatest nation, the greatest indebted nation in the world today is Japan. Do you know that? As far as debt to GDP? They're, they're indebted. Here's their ratio. The debt to, debt to GDP for Japan is 234%. In other words, if they paid 100% of what they could produce as a nation against their debt, they still have 134% left. Wow. And that's what you call underwater. There's a lot of nations underwater. Belgium, 128%. Italy, 135%. USA, 133% underwater. Paid 100% of the gross domestic product of the United States against our debt this year. We'd still be 34% in the red. By the way, some of you here would love to be only 34% in the red after a year paying down, wouldn't you? We got a lot of debt. We, we live with a lot of debt. In fact, debt's the kind of our culture. We kind of just live in debt at all times. The highest, by the way, debt to GDP of our nation since the end of World War II by 27%. Just to let you know, it ain't looking good. Personal debt, uh, the average American, and that's every one of us here, including the kids, the average American is $91,000 in debt. So, little sweetie, what's uh, Grace? Is, well, no, what's, is that her name? Stand up for a second. Can you stand up in the, in the pew? Pastor said you could. You can stand up in the pew just for a second. I just want you to look at her. Do you see her? She's a pretty little girl. She's a sweetheart. She's on average 91%, $91,000 in debt. Shame on you. Shame. <laughs> no, thank you, baby. I'm just picking on you. That's average. So we're averaged out over all the kids and all the adults and everybody who's paid off their mortgage. We still average $91,000 per person. That's average now. Half are above that and half are below that in the United States. We are indebted tremendously. In fact, the debt, the, the debt and the margin debt right now in the stock market is $936 billion. That's people who went and borrowed money from a bank or some lender that they put into the stock market hoping that the stock market would make a higher percentage than what they owe on their debt. And that's, 90, that's, by the way, 67% higher than it was in 2019, just to let you know where we are. Stuff is, mm -mm. it's real bad, super bad. We just live off of debt. Debt's just the, kind of the way we do things. seems to be in, in even more. Well, debt is a serious issue. Debt is a classic issue in the Scriptures. In fact, the Scripture says we're indebted to God beyond what we can pay. By the way, 134% GDP actually is a huge number, but it has, that actually is a number. You actually, we at least, at least in theory, you could pay it off. Because it's certain, it has a limit. It has a beginning, 1, 3, 4. It has a 134%. It's not 135. It's not 138. It's 134. Now, probably it'll continue to go up the way things seem to be. But, but, but that actually has a, has a conclusion. You can see the end of the road, even though it's way out there. It's still got an end to it. Guys, hear me. There is no end of the road for the debt that you and I have accumulated with regards to sin. There's no end of the road. How do I know that? Because hell is an eternal place. So you go to hell for eternity, for a whole eternity, you still haven't paid off your sin. There's no end of the road. It is a debt. In fact, debt is slavery, right? The, 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 the debtor is enslaved to the creditor, right? You are enslaved, listen, because of sin. Jesus, you and I. Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. Do you believe him? Do you believe him? It's the ultimate addiction. It's the ultimate debt. And we've incurred it, by the way, not just incurred it, but we're also paying, it's, it's compounding dividends. Notice Romans 12, 2, 5. Because of your unstubbornness and unrepentant heart, if that's you, I hope it's not, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when he, his righteous judgment will be revealed. Do you believe him? But here's the good news. That same God who will do this, you will pay, is willing to cancel it all out. Forgive you. Why wouldn't you take that? Why wouldn't you take it? God is going to forgive all your debts, and only God can forgive sins. Only the creditor can, can, can forgive the debtor. 
Let's say somebody owes you 10,000 bucks and I find out about it, you know, I'm a good pastor. So I go to the person that owes you 10,000 bucks and I say to them, I forgive you. I'm, I'm her pastor and I know that you owe her 10,000 bucks, you haven't been paying, but I'm just going to step in here and I'm going to forgive you that 10, you don't owe her that $10,000 anymore. Would that work for you, by the way? Would that make you feel good? The pastor just did a good deed for me. If they owed you 10000 bucks, I'd say, you idiot! What are you doing telling her that? She owes me that money. I'm not going to, because I said that you're forgiven, does that forgive her of what she owes you? Of course not. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Likewise, no one can forgive sins but God. You're indebted to God. You're going to go somewhere else? Listen, no one can forgive your sins. No one. You have to go to Him. No one can forgive but Him. By the way, we're going to be talking about Forgiveness. Forgiveness is also a, best, a good way to understand it. Forgiveness is you paying for someone else's sins. You want to know how steep the curve, the learning curve, the difficulty curve is of forgiveness? Because we're going to be getting to that. And I'm warning you right now, don't miss them, by the way. This, this sermon series we're going to get into about how to forgive people is, is incredibly important. We've been through it several times as a church. And I've been for 20 years. I think we've been through it twice. This will be our third time through. We really should go through it about every other year. Because the debt of sin that's in this room, and I mean the sin that's been committed against you, is tremendous. I know that that's true. I don't have to know what's happened in your life. I just know if you've lived in this world for very long, people have broken your heart, people have sinned against you, people have, are indebted to you, people have done stuff. People can be evil. Sometimes the, my experience as a pastor has been, sometimes the people closest to you can be the worst ones. People who should have loved you, should have treated you right, should have done right by you, or the people that you committed your life to. And they did you the wrongest, I mean the worst. So we're going to talk about the fact, hear me clearly on this, that the Bible requires you to forgive them. It's not an option for you. And so don't, don't expect I'm going to come here and say, well, you can choose to forgive or not forgive. I'm not going to ever tell you that because that would be a lie. Here's the only, only person in the universe that can choose to forgive or not is God. He's chosen to forgive. Everyone else who has been forgiven by God is required to forgive required. I can't opt out of it because to accept God's forgiveness is to accept my responsibility to forgive anyone who sinned against me. By the way, like I said, it's right here in the clause. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted against us, right? So, I, but I don't want to make light of it in the sense of saying, okay, you have to do this because, well, you do. And I tell you very much though, you can't do it. It's very, very hard, if not impossible. If, if anything, we read in this, this, this prayer that Jesus makes us pray, right? This model prayer that teaches us every clause is a whole category to fill in. It teaches us over and over again the stuff that we can't do. I can't bring king, God's kingdom. I can't feed myself. I'm dependent upon God for everything. I can't forgive myself. Likewise, I really can't forgive others either. There's a supernatural thing. An enabling of God that comes because of God's forgiveness of me in Christ Jesus. There's a supernatural enabling that comes that enables me to forgive people for horrible stuff that God says I have to forgive them for. God doesn't ask you to do something, command you to do something that you're incapable of. He's, he can make you able. That makes sense. So we're going to be learning that together. Very, very important. Very, very important. Because God ties our forgiveness, our, our day-to-day -day fellowship with Him, on our day-to-day -day forgiving of others. So we're going to get to that. But let's get back to where I was, because I, I was about to do something very good for you for Christmas. So are you ready? Because if, if I can forgive sins for, well, because I'm a pastor, you know, and I have you know, lots of experience and lots of clout and, um, <laughs> and authority, I've decided for Christmas to cancel everyone that's hearing, not people that listen online, because if you can't come to church, well, then we can't do this for you. <laughs> I've decided to cancel all your debts, all your loans, mortgages, taxes from here on. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so and I'm, in the back, there's a card that has my name on it, Dr. Bill Waddell, and you can just take it to the tax assessor office, and you can take it to your bank and say, you know, it was a great Sunday. I can just start afresh, you know. So I can just step in and forgive all your debts, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Sorry, I can't do that. Neither can anyone else step in and forgive your sins. But God himself has done it. Colossians 2. 
when you were dead in your sins, talk about underwater, that's underwater right there, under earth. You're dead in your sins and uncircumcision or your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness. It is a legal issue. He created laws that you broke. He's the judge, also the jury, also the one who paid for it in Christ, right? Legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, and here it is. He has taken it away and nailed it to the cross. There was something nailed to the cross when Jesus died, wasn't there? But I don't recall reading my sins. What did they nail on the cross? They nailed a placard. By the way, every time they crucified someone, they crucified thousands upon thousands of people. They had always put over their head, or at least where someone could read, they would always hang them in a place where people could see them and not get past them. You had to come into a city, you had to walk by crucified bodies, living and not. And then at their feet or over their head, depending on how high they were, they would place the indictment that was against them. They were charged with breaking the law, and this was the law that they broke. So, like I said, he was crucified between two criminals, and of course that's what was put over their heads. The whole purpose was so that when you travel into this town, you see people dying on a cross or already dead on a cross, and you see that crime up there, it would be a reminder of, oh, I better not do that. Make sense? They had a, that's a heavy-handed way of curbing crime. They did a good job of it. So they hung on Jesus' cross. What was the indictment? This is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. What kind of law is that? Well, he was sinless. It's interesting, even, even though they were trying to spite Jesus and more, more often, more likely, the Pharisees in that process, they didn't do anything. Actually, they had no right to nail anything on that cross because the Son of God and God himself had already nailed our sins to the cross. Only God can do that. No one else could. No one else could forgive our sins, but God did that. Hebrews tells us, this, this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, how many? One. You read the Old Testament, you find that they sacrificed over and over and over constantly. A, a priest, basically, you understand what an Old Testament priest was? They were butchers. That's all they ever did. Because people always sinned. So I commit one sin, that's a whole lamb. Guess what, if I go home and sin that afternoon, I've got to come up with another lamb and, and another one. So these guys are basically standing in plastic aprons, butchering animals all day, every day. That's all they ever did. They never sat down because people never stopped sinning. And the sacrifice that was made for their sins only paid for that one sin and not for the next one. So notice this priest, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, notice forever, sat down at the right hand of God. His, his work was completely done. For by one offering he is perfected forever ever, there it is again, those who have been sanctified. Have we been forgiven of our sins? Completely. Forever. He has no more work to do. How do we know it? Because he sat down. He's done. His job as priest, his job of offering for our sins, completed. It's forgiven. A hundred percent. The judge himself has declared us not guilty. Our position with God cannot be changed. You are once you've accepted Christ as personal Savior, you have become a child of God, and that position is a solid position. It is a forever position. Why? Because it says it. Forever, how long is forever? It's forever. Forever means forever. He's got to say it twice up there for us to get it, I guess, but there it is. So, so why? Back to our original question. Do we keep having to ask for forgiveness if he's already forgiven us forever? It's a good question. Sin no longer affects our standing with God, but it does affect our relationship with God. So you're, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, but your fellowship with God can be affected and is affected daily by how you act towards God, His rules, His laws. So every day I've got to come back and I've got to ask for forgiveness because I don't know about y'all, I haven't had a perfect day yet, I am keep waiting. You're waiting on me, I'm waiting on you, how about that? I haven't had a perfect day yet, I've got to come back and ask for forgiveness every single day. Every single day. Every single day. And it's not just a matter of... See, so, so I've been declared right. My, my indebtedness, my, my legal indebtedness has been fixed permanently in Christ. Why do I need to come back? Because here's, here's, here's so, so important that we get this. Because God isn't really interested in your legal status as an end thing. So yes, he's interested in your legal status as a means to an end, but not the end. So legally, you've been declared right. That isn't getting what God wants. See, God created you not so he could just have, I don't know, a bunch of people out there who were legally correct. 
He, want, he created you so that you could be His. So I'm legally, the standing of God as a child of God, but my fellowship with God day to day is dependent upon my fellowship with Him, my for, asking for forgiveness, keeping my life right. So it's a constant thing. So God didn't save me so I could be legally right. God saved me so that I could be His. So, so here's, here's the picture. So here, well, let, let's look at this. Uh, to say that we've been accepted in Christ is an understatement. Here's, here's God's goal for you. If anyone loves me, notice it's all about love. He, of course, will keep my commandments. Not, I don't prove my love by keeping his commandments. Actually, if I love him, I will keep his commandments. You keep my word. My father will love him, and get this, we will come to him and make our home with him. So you get caught doing something you shouldn't do, and they take you over here to Cameron County, and they put you on trial, and they acquit you because you had enough money to pay off your lawyers. Or I don't know what you did. But when it's all over, the judge says, I love you so much, I'm going to come and live with you. <laughs> really? No. No, he, he's interested in right and wrong. He's interested in the people that deserve to be acquitted, acquitted, and the people that deserve to be condemned are condemned. But when he goes home, adios. He doesn't care that much about you. He doesn't, you know, want to live with you, for crying out loud. He's just interested in justice. All right, so if that's all you think God is interested in, you have missed it, guys. God's not interested in justice as an end in itself. He's interested in a relationship with you. Relationship means, you got a relationship with anybody? You ever sin in that relationship? You don't ask for forgiveness, that relationship won't last. You've got to constantly be saying, I'm sorry, because imperfection is going to make you do it. Constantly. So God is interested, not that you be in a correct standing with him, that's just a means to an end. The end is that you be his. That you be his. He created Adam and Eve, no other reason than just to walk in fellowship in the garden with him. Wow. Doesn't he have a lot of other things to do? Sure. That's what he wants. So, so, so again, hear me on this. So how desperate must that relationship mean to him that he's willing to punish his son for all that you did just to have it. It means so much to him. Do we really understand how great his love is for us? So it, and it may be a better question. Is he getting what he paid for? So got, My legal standing is right in Jesus. Awesome, great. That's not what God paid for. He paid to have you. Well, my day-to-day -day standing with God isn't very good. Well, he's not getting what he paid for. That's why he says every day we've got to come to him and say, among, uh, including, uh, including asking for bread, asking for forgiveness. That fellowship means so much to him. You need to learn, we well, do, learn to make it mean so much to us in the same way. Heaven's going to be about that. You can believe it. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you loved us so much. As Paul, Apostle Paul told the Ephesians, if we could just grasp how, how wide and how deep and how high and how long is your love for us that surpasses, it surpasses understanding. We're not going to be able to wrap our brains around it. It surpasses it. If we could just grasp that, see how important that is. See that these things that you're leading us and that you're teaching us, it all comes from that, that one thing. You, you love us so much. You're, you're interested in what's good for us. You're not gaining anything we're not adding anything to heaven by glorifying you or asking for your kingdom or being a part of your kingdom. We're not, you're not on the receiving end of anything. You're on the giving end of all of it. So God, since you're the giver and we're the receiver, I pray, God, that we would allow you to give us forgiveness today. I pray for the person here who has never once come to you and said, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I pray that they would turn their heart today. So I be merciful to me, a sinner. I thank you that you stand so ready to do that. So ready, so eager to forgive. Now we're living off that every day, but today especially. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.